Well hello, my name is Andy Tidy and welcome back for a third series of Canal Hunter. In the previous two series you'll remember that I was following the route of the original Birmingham Canal completed in 1769. Firstly as it made its way through from Birmingham to the coalfields of West Bromwich and then as it went on from West Bromwich all the way through Tipton, Coesley and out to Wolverhampton to join the Staffs and Worcester Canal. And the purpose of these Canal Hunter series, based on the BCN, is to seek out the other 60 miles. The 60 miles of canals which have been lost over time. These lost canals were originally documented by Richard Chester Brown in his book called The Other 60 Miles. And here we are, another 40 years later, and we're going back to see what remains. In this series, we're branching off. We're jumping forward. 25 years to 1792 and at this stage we had the Worley and Essington Canal being built. The original idea behind the Worley and Essington Canal was to connect the, uh, the towns of Walsall and Wolverhampton to the coal mines in the Essington area. So the canal was built to go to Sneed uh, which is near Bloxwich and then to turn north up to uh, Worley and on the Worley Bank and to Essington and to turn right and to go close to Walsall at Birchills. Now the Worley and Essington is quite a complicated canal, both in terms of when bits were added, when bits were taken away, impacts of mergers and acquisitions. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time now painting the scene. I will go over it when we get to each episode. But for now, bear with me, I'm going to give you a potted history of the Worley and Essington Canal. The canal was built to very specific dimensions. It was designed to be 28 feet wide at the surface, 16 feet wide at the base and 4 foot 6 deep. Now any of you who have travelled to Worley and Essington will know that the surface width may be more or less as original uh, but it's shallow, it's narrow uh, and it's silted. But it is, crucially, still navigable. It has to be said that the Birmingham Canal were not exactly keen on this new canal being joined into it. They were afraid they were going to lose their water. So they insisted that when the canal was going to make a junction at Horsley Fields, that it had to have a stop lock and that the water in the Worley and Essington would always be held at least six inches higher than the Birmingham Canal. Within two years, in 1794, the Worley and Essington committee were already deciding to expand. They were seeking approval from the government to extend their canal all the way through to Brown Hills and Ogley and then down through 30 locks allowing them to join up with the Birmingham and Faisley Canal at Huddlesford. And while they were about it the uh, Worley Nessington Canal Company also obtained approval to build the Doe End Canal and that was to reach the limestone workings at Hayhead and that is where we moor our boats. Now the Worley and Essington is notorious because it's an extreme contour canal. It's not called the Curly Worley for nothing. It winds to and fro and in its course to get from Wolverhampton through to Brown Hills, the actual course the canal takes is almost twice the distance as if the crow flies. It hugs the 463 foot contour all the way. And when it was built, it was never going to be a fast canal. They put limits on it when they started. The rule was the fastest a boat was allowed to go was three miles an hour and the slowest a boat was allowed to go was two miles an hour. There was to be absolutely no overtaking and any boat that was travelling from the west to the east which meant it was travelling empty always had to give way to the loaded boats coming from the coal fields in the east back to the west. Now those speed limits, basically they're still pretty aspirational today. Now if you remember in series one and series two, the lost canals that I've been seeking out, I've been picking them off by the odd hundred yards here and a hundred yards there. Well, the Worley and Essington is a completely different kettle of fish. The Worley and Essington itself had 34 miles of canals. But over time, the arms around it grew and grew. And then as the coal works finished, um, the, about, uh, the arms became abandoned. And up here, 
on the northern perimeter of the Birmingham Canal navigations, there are no less than 27 miles of abandoned canal to be explored. So I think you're going to see quite a lot more of me out on my bike over the coming weeks. In some ways, the Worley and Essington Canal was always the poor relation to the Birmingham Canal. You see, it went out into undeveloped land. There, there was some industry and there would have been some coal mining going on out there, but it hadn't really been industrialised. And right from the outset, the owners of the Worley and Essington struggled to find trade to carry. Overtures of a partnership were going on from 1820 onwards. And the piggy in the middle was Walsall. Walsall had already got a canal coming in from Riders Green. What they wanted was a connection through up onto the Worley and Essington. But neither the Worley and Essington committee nor the Birmingham co committee could decide who was going to build the connecting locks. In the end, in desperation, Walsall said, hang on, we'll build the locks. We'll pay for them and we'll charge you tolls. Well, this brought both parties to the altar. By 1840, the Worley and Essington and the Birmingham Canal had become a combined entity. And at a moment, the Birmingham Canal navigations was born. So from that point on, it becomes the BCN. Well, no sooner had the BCN been formed, than they started to take advantage uh, of this newfound resource to the north. They built no less than three connections through from the Birmingham levels up to the Whirl in Essington. They built the Warsaw Locks, which was the catalyst, and they built the Bentley Canal, which is the one we're going to start looking at in our first proper episode, and they built the Rushall Canal over at the far end of the Doe End, connecting it down to the Tame Valley. And these improved connections absolutely kick-started the Industrial Revolution in this northern periphery of the BCN. Coal was exploited, exploited in the Brown Hills area. You had clay measures in Aldridge as well as coal, so the clay works developed there, making these uh, classic blue-red bricks that you see everywhere around the BCN. And they also got access to the lime workings at Hay Head. And this lime was particularly good for making quicklime, and it literally glued the BCN together. All this combined allowed the iron industry that was around Pelsall to explode into existence. So suddenly, the northern BCN was transformed, and the Worley Essington, which had been languishing and unsuccessful, absolutely blossomed. And so we're going to explore the lost arms that existed around the Worley Nessington. But I can't leave you with without at least one explore. So I'm going to take you to one of my favourite and most secretive little locations on the BCN. It's an absolute gem. It's just about a half a mile north of Brown Hills and it's called the Slough Arm. Now I know you'll be thinking, isn't the Slough Arm that one down near London? Well, yes, there is a slough arm down there, but it is not the one that I love so much. This one uh, branches off and it's less than a mile long and it's an absolute gem. It's got, uh, it had an old entrance bridge, covered loading bay. It had a bridge at the far end. There was a mine pumping engine, which kept it in water. And there was even a lock, which remains in the woodlands even today. So let's go and take a look at the slough arm. And I hope you'll enjoy this series. As I say, we're going to start over in the west and we'll start with the, uh, with the Bentley arm and then we'll proceed always backwards towards the east. So with every episode, we'll be moving closer and closer to our home. So I hope you enjoy this series three. I look forward to showing you all these hidden corners of the, of the BCN and uh, happy hunting. Now just to prove we are generally on the Worley Nessington Canal, this is the corner where the slough arm exits. So maybe three or four years after the main canal had been dug, they decided that there were good coal deposits up here in this little corner, well worth exploiting, worth enough to actually dig their own private canal. Now the maps show a narrow entrance and I think it's through here as you can see I'm coming through here 
a bit before all the weeds have been knocked down. So there's a bit of a struggle to get in. But through here, into the trees, if we look, I'm looking for the remains of an old brick bridge. And if we look here in the thicket, you can see the brick edging of the old bridge. So the narrow flat top bridge came in through here and if I swing around we can see phase one of the slow arm development. The canal entered into a triangular basin and over on the far corner there was a covered loading bay. Normally when you come in here there might be a bit of a muddy puddle in the middle but the rain has been so strong in the last week or two it's completely filled up this level of the canal bed. This is pretty much at original canal height. You can even see some, lock, some side walls. The slow arm used to drain itself away into the Whirly and Essington Canal. These days it still acts as a land drain, but uh, they've cut a, a, a channel away to the edge and as you can see water's flowing out away towards Brown Hills. This rickety little wooden bridge I've just discovered, it looks pretty lethal but I'll give it a go and try and walk around that way. So beyond the basin the arm continues on, now in water, up for maybe a third of a mile, and we'll follow its course. We've now reached the junction between the end of the first phase, which you see over to the left or the middle distance, that's a loading bay, and then the junction into the new arm built in the 1830s branches off here to the right. And here's a broader view of the lock entrance. You can see the, uh, the lock chamber is remarkably intact. It's got the, the grooves in the side for stop planks. It's got the recesses for the gates and the western wing wall it's very intact. In fact the bolts holding on all the woodwork are still embedded into the masonry. That's the curved heel where the, uh, the lock gate would sit. You can see it clearly these were two twin gates not one big thick one and you can still see the steel retaining strap that used to uh, hold the lock gates into place. Now the Brown Hills wing wall has uh, collapsed somewhat and you can see that the water is flowing into the uh, lock chamber at the uh, level of the bottom of the lock, not the top, so the top section of the channel is completely empty. And here's an upstream view of the lock chamber here on the slough arm. Here I am standing bang in the middle of the navigation channel immediately to the north of the lock entrance. Uh, some of the lock has been lost but if we look here into the trees you can find the curving remains of the old wing wall. It's coming in here among the roots of the trees, bending its way in and narrowing down. 
So we've probably got maybe just over half of the original lock chamber in place. I suspect the rest, uh, which you can see a few bricks over on the far side, uh, they've probably been used elsewhere and people have nicked them for building projects. And here we are at the junction between phase two, which contains the lock, and phase three, which was built again in the 1830s to reach uh, the Brown Hills Colliery. The original arm continued off to my left under what is now a railway embankment. And the railway embankment has been turned into a very pleasant footpath or cycleway. And it provides really great access through to the Slough Branch beyond. So you come off the main footpath, bear off down the embankment, there is phase three of the Slough Arm. We're now getting to the upper reaches of phase three. And as you can see from the amount of mud exposed, after a few days uh, of sunshine, the water level's declining and already it's returning back to its usual muddy state. It's good to see that in any abandoned canal, there is always, always an abandoned canal tire. Now the slough arm does offer one final treat up here at the top end. This is the canal bridge which carries engine lane over the top of the arm. It's really well preserved. You can even see the towpath showing on the far side. Let's go over and have a look. Right, well I've come down through the other side because it's easier to get down and we'll take a wander through on the towpath. So this is the bridge carrying engine lane. Now engine lane, lane gives a clue to one of the issues of this particular canal. It's up high, there's almost no water supply. This is the end result of two weeks of horrendous rain. So there's just no way that the canal itself could sustain the water supply needed to move boats. So they installed an engine next to the colliery, used the coal and pumped the, uh, the water up in here, just enough to uh, keep the boats afloat. And because the water has generally been dammed up as I've come upstream, we're probably getting close again to the original height. Um, I'm guessing that what I'm looking at here is the towpath. So yeah, the water level is maybe six inches down on what it would have been originally. And as you can see, the canal continues in water up for another few hundred yards so it could reach the collieries beyond. So this is the end of my mini explore here on the first introductory episode of Canal Hunter Series 3. The Slough Arm is one, absolutely one of my favourite little lost corners of the BCN. It's my own little secret. I don't know why I'm telling you guys because you're going to come and stamp all over it. Anyhow, it's big enough to take a few more visitors. Come and have a look at the Slough Arm and I hope you enjoy following me as I explore all the lost arms that radiate out from the amazing Worley and Essington Canal. So I'll see you next time. Happy hunting.